Um, which is there on Camp Street, um, Newspaper Row, which is currently well, the 300, 400 block. I did know that, but Richard's in the audience, so I'm glad he's here. The 300, 400 block of Camp Street. It was actually situated. Most of the newspapers and the publishing houses and the Elizabeth were all within that kind of rough area. Yes. Are prints of the lithographs uh, available for viewing? Uh, they're available for viewing. Um, Tulane, Louisiana collection has some, and the Mint has some. The people who did the microfilm should be shot. Um, <laughs> they, there's some in it, and it's off kilter. I have scanned all the microfilm, and I'm working on scanning all the originals that I, that I can. Yes? What was the format? Was it like a tabloid? How many pages? Did it was eight pages. It started out slightly smaller, and then it went to 15. And it was really revolutionary for the time because most of the newspapers did their news in columns. And they had their masthead was architecture or, or birds or some kind of animal or art deco. And the mascot chose a woman as its kind of leader. And they would frequently publish uh, articles and cartoons of her holding her light of justice. And this is four or five years before the Statue of Liberty, so they're very much ahead of their time. But the usual was the front page was a, a cover illustration like that. You would open it up to two pages of, um, it actually opened and then folded out this way. So it would fold out to a giant sheet. And it ran anywhere between two advertisements. And then at the back, they would usually have a story Toward the later years, they usually would do this in different panels of illustration, but it was the largest illustrated journal um, in the South. Oh, and an interesting note, which I'm hoping to prove soon. If you read in your program the quote from um, the press about how the New Orleans newspapers have been carrying the divorce, and I remember thinking, that's so wrong. Like, how is this written during this time period? And then I noticed that it was edited by Henry Reicher, which is the same last name as the judge writer that issued the injunction against them and that they just ripped to shreds. So I'm hoping to see a connection there. Yes? Uh, what was the circulation of the mascot and how were they supported by advertising or by uh, They were supported by advertisers. Um, they say the circulation was roughly, I've seen estimates between four and 5,000. Um, in the beginning, the advertisements seemed to kind of run anywhere from organs to false limbs to cures and toward the last few years it was mainly bars and saloons <laughs> and uh, different uh, sorts of establishments but they have a full um, and their advertisements got more and more elaborate so I'm wondering what happened toward the end when they were still running um, anywhere from the pages ran four columns between four and ten columns of advertisements so I'm still trying to figure out how it actually ended and why. Yes. Are you going to do a book? Yes. Yay. 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 Yes. Did they have something to do with Storyville? They actually predated Storyville, um, but they were the first newspaper to write about that there should be a legalized district in Storyville, and they're actually um, credited with the first newspaper to come up with that and wrote about it extensively. But they did not, um, they were not around during Storyville. But they did like to write about prostitutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think they inspired the, the, the Reacher or the one that came out of Storyville? Or there, there was a couple of rags that came out of there was the, um There was the Sunday Sun, Sunday which Sun. was a newspaper during that time. And I have read, um, I've also learned in different books when one person quotes it wrong, everybody else seems to quote it wrong, and it's not right. So I found some um, mistakes. <laughs> but some books have credited that they said that they had a regular column called On the Turf that would write specifically about the comings and goings of Madness, but I've never seen that. I've never seen that column. But they would write sometimes about Madness who just came back from a trip, or who got his tapestries, or had a <laughs> piano. Um, but it wasn't Storyville oriented like some people think it was. It started out, um, kind of reminds me of Edwards. John Edwards, who starts out his political career, he ends with a sex scandal, and that, that's all anybody's going to remember. So the mascot did start out very, very political, but just toward the last few years was more of more sex and crime and killing. Mm -hmm. And it was it stirred up a lot of racial <coughs> with the hands of the editor. 
Um, because I have seen things where you would write about um, this man spent six months in jail for a rape that he probably didn't commit, and he's black, and he couldn't go to trial, and this is an outrage. And then the next article, you know, the next month would show just incredibly racist drawings and description. And they would fluctuate. Uh, same as um, they used to have a column called Dago of the Week to watch out for. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of their um, drawings and illustrations were extremely racist, and then on the other hand, they would be in another in another article, and I think they're probably no longer the editor. Mm -hmm. We're all going to find again. <laughs>